The Sega Master System and Game Gear share much of the same hardware, a smart move by Sega that allowed them not only to easily develop games for both systems at the same time, but to leverage an existing library of SMS games for the Game Gear. There was even an official adapter that let you play Master System games on the portable handheld, but unlike Nintendo's Super Game Boy, Sega never came out with a way to play Game Gear games on a home console. But if they did, what would that have been like? Let's check it out as well as some other Game Gear info and different ways to play Game Gear games on your TV. Let's start with a quick overview of both systems. The Master System was released in 1986 as a successor to Sega's SG-1000 consoles. All games were generated in a 256 by 192 resolution via a Z80 processor running at 4 MHz. It had 8 KB of RAM, 16 KB of VRAM, and had a total color palette of 64 colors, out of which only 32 could be presented at the same time on screen. The controller only had two buttons, with the console itself having a pause button next to the reset button. The Game Gear was released in 1990 and included pretty much the same specs with a few major differences. First, it included a start button right on the console in place of the SMS's pause button. There was only a single mono speaker and most games were mono only, but it did technically support stereo sound through the headphone jack. Next, the built-in 3.2-inch screen only supported a 160 by 144 pixel resolution, creating a much smaller gameplay area. Lastly, while it could also only support 32 colors on screen at once, it was able to pull from a palette of 4096 colors. These differences allowed the Game Gear to be backward compatible with the Master System, but not the other way around. This resulted in some Game Gear exclusive games, some ports of Master System games, and some games that were literally just Master System ROMs in a Game Gear cart. Let's check out each one of those and how they work on an original Game Gear. Many Game Gear games were also available on the Master System with very few coding differences between them. The developers would simply crop the gameplay area, move the HUD to the edges of the Game Gear screen, and map pause to start. Some developers would update a few graphics here and there, but overall it was far less work than a full port of a game from a different platform. I think a great example is Sonic 1 and 2. These are completely independent from the Genesis versions, and Yuzo Koshiro's team was able to create a game for Sega's existing home platform, as well as a game that would help drive sales of its new handheld console, which really worked out for everyone. Porting wasn't necessary at all, though, you could connect Master System cartridges directly to the handheld via an accessory called the Master Gear Converter. The Game Gear would know what mode to boot in via pins on the cart. If pin 42 is connected to ground, then it would boot in Game Gear mode. If pin 42 was tied to voltage, it would boot in Master System mode. Then map the pause button to start and change some of the I.O. rights. As a kid, I thought it was pretty mind-blowing that I could play the few SMS games I owned on my Game Gear. Sure, it didn't support light gun or 3D games, but there were only a handful of those anyway. Nowadays, unless you have a more modern screen replacement that can handle SMS resolutions properly, I think it's more of a novelty than a great way to play. It's not just that the Game Gear screen itself was bad, it's that the Master System's 256 by 192 resolution had to get cropped and smushed down to the 160 by 144 resolution screen. Sometimes that was fine, but other times it made the game even harder to see. Here's a fact that many Game Gear fans might not know. A few developers took advantage of this backward compatibility and just put a Master System ROM right in a Game Gear cartridge. The cart had pin 42 tied to voltage, so the handheld treated it exactly as if the Master Gear converter in an original SMS cart was being used. I'm not gonna lie, it took Maxim from SMS Power and Emulicious developer Calindro multiple tries to get that through to me, because I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that a game I played all the time as a kid was actually just a Master System game. In hindsight, it makes sense though. As soon as we boot it, you could see the squished TMSS screen like what happens when we boot Master System games. Also, Start does nothing on the title screen, just like the pause button would on the SMS with this game. It only starts after hitting the 1 button. 
So basically, getting Master System games to run on the Game Gear was relatively easy and worked well for both developers and us at home. Native Game Gear games did sometimes look a bit better as they were designed for that low quality screen, as opposed to being designed to play on a CRT like SMS games. And oh boy was that screen bad. I have clear memories of being a kid and getting frustrated because I couldn't find a comfortable angle to actually see my Game Gear while playing. There really weren't any other choices though, so us 90s kids just put up with it. But I would have loved the option to play those games both on the go and on my master system whenever I was in front of a TV. Which brings us to the focus of this video. As mentioned before, Game Gear games weren't directly backward compatible with the Master System for a few reasons. First, there was no start button on the Master System's controller, but that could have easily been mapped to the pause button that was right on the Master System itself. Next, the Game Gear supported stereo audio, but I'm pretty sure that could have just been routed through the Master System's mono audio channel. The real problem was the Game Gear had a much wider color palette to choose from, meaning the games would never look exactly the same if it was ported over to the SMS. Some creative homebrew developers, starting with Chris Covell, took some Game Gear exclusive games and patched them to map the Game Gear's color to the nearest available color on the Master System. They also mapped Start to Pause and essentially created a way to play patched ROMs on an original Master System via a ROM cart. While this worked, it caused one major problem, the unused screen area. Let's use the Mr. FPGA to demonstrate. If we load the Game Gear version of Sonic, you'll see the 160 by 144 resolution displayed. If we then open up the viewable screen area to the Master System's 256 by 192, more of the game appears. What you're seeing is the result of the developer simply moving the heads-up display and cropping for the Game Gear version, but the rest of the resolution is still there. Now let's take a look at a game that was designed specifically for the Game Gear, not the Master System. Mega Man. Once we open up the full screen resolution, there's a bunch of interference and garbage around the screen. In some areas you get a bit more screen real estate, but everything else around the screen is distracting and misleading in some cases. Like with this scene right here. In the normal viewing area, it's pretty obvious what to do, but when you open it up, the ladder just kind of looks like it's going to nothing, and you almost feel like jumping down the hole is the way to go, which obviously isn't. Some of the Game Gear SMS developers have taken the time to basically rewrite a lot of code in these games to extend the viewing area and get rid of the garbage. Check out Tails Adventure. You can see the dev did an excellent job, and it feels like a Master System game. Sadly, that's really the only way you can guarantee a good Game Gear to SMS experience with exclusive games. Someone has to take the time to basically rewrite it. I think if Sega just simply used the same color palette for the Game Gear, developers would be more inclined to create a version for both. In fact, imagine if Sega made a Super Game Boy-like adapter, but for the Game Gear. Well, developer Apocalypse did just that. Here's a device made by a homebrew developer that most Sega fans would have loved in the 90s if it were an official adapter. A way to play Game Gear games on the Master System. It's currently a prototype and works very similar to how the GG to SMS hacks work. Start is mapped to pause, stereo audio is processed as mono, and the color palette is mapped to the next nearest color the Master System has available. And it works! With all the same caveats as explained before. Games that were on both the SMS and Game Gear should look fine with the expanded viewing area. But Game Gear exclusives will have some issues. The colors might not look right due to the auto mapping and there's garbage around the screen, just like the ROM hacks I showed earlier. Unfortunately, this isn't a problem that could be solved on the adapter, and even small sprite flickers can be distracting. Of course, if you get creative, you could always just make a bezel out of cardboard and just mask the extra area for Game Gear exclusives. My example here is a bit silly, but I know quite a few people with an artistic eye that could probably make a bezel that looks like a giant Game Gear. Still, even if this never leaves prototype phase, how awesome is this? It's basically like Sega's version of the Super Game Boy. But the Super Game Boy basically had a Game Boy inside it, and this acts more like a Game Genie. But I still think of it as a Super Game Gear. Or Super Game Gear Boy. Whatever. There's a few other things I'd like to test with this adapter, though. 
First, let's see if this works via the PowerBase Converter, an official device designed for the original Genesis that allows it to be backward compatible with Master System games. I always thought this thing looked awesome and was a really cool way to ensure backward compatibility. Heck, it even worked with Sega 3D games. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work with the Game Gear converter, at least here in the prototype phase. Neither does the aftermarket converter made by Rene from DB Electronics. This converter also allows for FM sound to be enabled, which is a really awesome addition to some games. FM sound requires a video all on its own, though. There's one last thing I want to try with this adapter, the TV tuner. I remember wanting one of these so bad as a kid, because the thought of having a portable TV and a portable game console absolutely blew my mind. Remember, this is 20 plus years before cell phones and streaming video, so having something handheld that a kid could carry around with and do both was absolutely awesome. When I was a kid, I used to walk into every single game store at every mall that I went to, always looking for these, and I never found them in stock. And in fact, I wasn't able to pick up one until long after analog TV signals had stopped being broadcast. So while I can't show you any over-the-air signals now, I can show you video through the 3.5mm connector that it came with. It's the same type of jack you'll find for any stereo audio adapter, except one input is mono audio and the other is composite video. Here it is working on original hardware. The connection's a little flaky, but it's really funny to see virtual racing running on a Game Gear. The Game Gear has dedicated pins that allow the TV tuner to work, basically bypassing the whole circuitry in the console. For that reason, I doubt there's any way it'll work through a master system, but I'm a nerd and I want to try anyway. As expected, it won't boot past the BIOS screen. This would have been completely useless anyway, but it was a lot of fun to try it out. As a note, the TV tuner won't work with most, if not all, screen mods for the same reasons. Speaking of Game Gear mods, there's definitely a few things we have to mention. There's no way I could do a video about a Game Gear without talking about the capacitor problem. Every single Game Gear out there has caps that are leaking, and if you don't clean them up and replace them with new ones, the capacitor fluid will eat away at the boards to the point that they'll be unfixable. This isn't an easy job though, so either practice on other electronics first, or find a professional to do it for you. If you plan on doing it yourself, the Console 5 store sells cap kits based on your Game Gear motherboard revision. Just reference the page and your motherboard to figure out which board rev you have. If your board is damaged beyond repair, a developer named Mateus Nilwick has completely reverse engineered all three boards, including the main motherboard. If you have a single ASIC Game Gear that's completely unfixable, or you just need an audio or power board, you'll definitely want to look into Mateus's work. His main board replacement requires a more modern screen, but that's something you'll probably want to add anyway. And if you're interested in Game Gear screen mods, I strongly recommend checking out Tito from Macho Nacho Productions, as he highlights all the best new handheld screen mods out there, as well as brand new replacement cases like the aftermarket one I showed in this video. The only other mod to mention is a board that allows you to use a Genesis controller with your consoleized Game Gear. That's also available on the Console 5 store, and I think a few other people are selling their own version as well. Since playing Game Gear games on a Master System isn't the easiest or most reliable way, why not just mod a Game Gear to output TV signals? That's exactly what Tim Worthington did a while back by creating a mod kit. You can install this right into the Game Gear itself, or remove the motherboard and create a consoleized version like the Behar Brothers made a few years ago. This works really well and outputs composite, S-video, and RGB, all with stereo audio. The games are fully cropped so there's no garbage on the screen, and while yes, it only fills the middle of the screen, that's basically the same as all the other handheld on TV solutions, like the Super Game Boy, Game Boy Player, etc. McWill made a similar kit as well that also allows for a screen replacement. There aren't as many video output modes, but this one will do 480p VGA as well. I don't think any of these consolation mods process Master System games properly though, so games from the list I showed earlier will all have color palette issues. That's only a problem if you were dead set on using those few original Game Gear carts, but overall it's much easier to just pick up the Master System versions of those games for use on a TV. Of course, you don't need original hardware at all. 
There's plenty of emulation options out there that let you play Game Gear games on your phone, on a Raspberry Pi, and of course the Mr.'s FPGA implementation is excellent. There's also the analog pocket that, once it's in stock, will let you play original cartridges on both the handheld itself, as well as on a TV via its optional dock's HDMI output. So in conclusion, if you're looking to play Game Gear games on your TV, here's what I suggest, at least to get you started. First, check to see if the game that you're looking to play is a Game Gear exclusive, or if it had a Master System version. If there's an SMS ROM available, that'll probably be the easiest way to go about doing this. Next, double check that the SMS game is actually the same as the Game Gear game. There's a few cases like Game Gear Shinobi and Game Gear Aleste where the names are basically the same, but it's actually a totally different game. What to do with Game Gear exclusives is tough though. For me personally, I'd first look for a Game Gear to SMS patch and see how far the developers went with that particular game. Is all the game garbage cleaned up and are all the buttons mapped properly? If so, that's probably the easiest solution. But if you really need to play your original Game Gear carts on a TV, or if you're just a huge fan and want all of the Game Gear options available, everything I talked about in this video is a really great solution. But that's it for this time. Before I go, I want to make sure to thank everybody who supports any of the monthly services, as well as just using affiliate links and click-throughs to make sure that this channel can keep going, because without your support, none of these videos, the weekly podcast, or the website, or any of the behind-the-scenes development would ever be possible. So thank you all so much, and I'll see you next time.